Okay, so I want to introduce our speaker today. Hey, this is Gary James. So he's been with us since pretty much when we started this, like three, four years, right? Been a while. Yeah, back when we started the Emerging Business Group, we said, you know, we need to have some strategic partners. You know, people would really understand the operational side of things, because, you know, we're bookkeepers, we're, we're accountants, right? We're the green eye shade, do all that stuff, we do the financial stuff. And we just wanted to, you know, partner with somebody that could take the idea that an entrepreneur has, an idea on a napkin, and figure out how to get funding, and figure out how to develop the product, and take it to market. I mean, there's a lot of stuff there, right, to do. And Gary can do all that stuff. We can handle all the financial stuff, you know, but Gary can do all this other stuff. And so he, he does workshops here, you know, regularly. And once in a while, we'll have him come and do one of our emerging business seminars here, which we have at lunchtime. And so that time has come again. And so I'm so glad to have him. He's one of the smartest guys I know. He teaches these concepts about startups throughout the valley. You know, I mean, I don't know what you do, you do every week practically. He does a lot of stuff. He does a lot of them. And so he's very well connected in the valley. He's the founder of South Valley Angels. And so he has a big angel group where they do it. They fund a lot of companies. And they've done that for like three years now. Is that when you started? Yeah, that? five years, about four years. So we've been funding now about four years since our first one. We've invested about 4.2 million. All right. For a small awesome. little angel group at 50 and 100K a pop. So he's, and he's becoming known internationally. Right. Saudi Arabia. Great place to be known. Right? <laughs> right? Yeah, President Trump. So he's going to Saudi Arabia. He's been there before, and they bring him in, and they want to know how to do startups. And they're like, they brought in the subject matter expert in the world to do that. And they can't get him there enough. No, they can't. He'll, he'll only go like two months at a time. He's going this in August and September. Because uh, he does like it. But, uh, but yeah, he's in big demand. So let's give Gary a warm welcome. You're going to love him. A lot of low expectations there. <laughs> uh, I hope you guys everybody here. Um, are, is everybody here pretty much an uh, ASL client? How many, or how many people came here that aren't an ASL client and just saw this out on the postings that are different? Okay, okay. So we got most of them. All right. Well, before we get started, I'll give you a little bit about my, my background. So I've been developing products pretty much my whole career. I started off as a systems engineering large corporation. I ran their R&D for like 15 years, designed got around 20 combat vehicles, a lot of night vision technology, and a lot of current stealth and drones and things like that for a long time for those guys. Uh, so I've always been on the idea where we need to find something, we got a problem, go design it, make it happen, figure out how to design something to go do the next great thing. And then I got my first startup in 1999. 98, 99, somewhere in that neighborhood. Uh, and it was actually in what we call today cloud. Back then we called it application service providers or ASP. And the world was so not ready for an ASP yet. But investors were ready for us, so we went and did our first pitch and got $25 million check. But we'll talk about that later. That, those days are so gone. Those are we're going to talk about what you need to know about startups today. <clears throat> anyway, uh, so I've done that. Um, I launched South Valley Angels about five years ago. Um, and like, uh, <coughs> Like uh, we were talking about earlier, um, like Mark was saying, uh, I launched the first uh, corporate innovation center in Saudi Arabia last year with the Saudi Telecom, which is an $85 million company. So we just set up their corporate center. They put 12 startups in there. And so we started that in January. By November, we had one startup acquired, uh, one startup had 35,000 repeat customers every month, and the, another one was funded, and the other nine was sort of putzing around doing a startup too. But that was a pretty good rate for the middle of the desert that had never ever done that before, so that was kind of interesting. Okay, so this was kind of fun. Mark called me up and asked me if I wanted to put something together about top ten things to know about startups. And I'd never done this before, but I thought it was kind of fun. So I kind of put this together in no particular order. And it was kind of nice because we can we can uh, go through sort of what I call short attention span talks because there's no law, there's, there's, there's no one topic from start to beginning, so we get a bunch of talk about a lot of little things. And I'm not going into each one real deep, but uh, you know, I kind of put them together, maybe have some dialogue, and everybody has some questions, you know, spark a little conversation. 
So let's go ahead and get started with the uh, the first one. Again, these aren't a top ten. They're in no particular order. They're actually the order that came to my mind. Um, so uh, let's see if this works. All right. So let's start about the first thing. So the first thing that's important to know right now is the entire dynamics of startups have changed. Startups have now gone mainstream. It's no longer just the crazy people in Silicon Valley doing what they do and then making TV shows out of it and stuff like that. You go to every country and they're everywhere. Um, it's now a college career difference. There's a lot of kids that are coming straight out of uh, high school and have no concept of going to college at all. Um, I think you're going to see a lot of changes that are going on. Because of that, being, being mainstream, there's a lot of changes coming in the industry. Now, the Silicon Valley probably won't change because it's already moved itself to an elitist status and they don't function by this model anymore anyway. They just, they just look for unicorns and, you know, the next big Facebook. They really don't care about funding innovation and technology. There's, they're, in a different, they're in a different game. They can do that because there's 10,000 startups on every corner. They can, they can just shop and do what they want. The rest of the world's not that fortunate. So let's talk about that. So this map here is about, uh, about 18 months old, but it's still pretty accurate. This shows all the startups, I mean, all the incubators, accelerators, and co-work spaces in the world. So if you start with the purple, the purple are big numbers, then it goes down to the reds, and then down to the blues. So every single country has got an incubator, an accelerator, or a co-work space. So when I do these talks up in Palo Alto, and three quarters of the room is sitting there from another country, I ask you, so why are you coming here? Why are you here? You've got this in your own country. Why don't you do it there? The reality is it's much easier to do it there than to come over here where you're not even a local, you're not even close. As an investor, uh, one of the things that's still fairly common is that a lot of investors still just draw a circle 100 miles around their office and say, if you're not inside that circle, I'm not investing. But it's hard enough to invest in a startup that's across the street and keep them on track than it is to invest in one that's across the water that you don't even see or have no, no communication with hardly at all. So I always ask that question. So now to give you a sense of this, if you look at this, you'll see some really interesting things. Russia has not adopted the uh, incubator accelerator very well. I'm sure you can't read these numbers, but just to throw a couple of these out. You got 340 in the Saudi region, you got 2,028 in this area, which again, some of those are probably Israel. But then you come over here and you've got 15,000 just on the west coast of the United States. So we've got more than virtually all the entire Middle East and Europe combined. Just to give you a, a sample of how that kind of floats around. However, they are everywhere, and because of that, I truly believe that incubators and accelerators are going to replace colleges and universities for a whole lot of the population coming down the road. We already know that a lot of people just aren't cut out for college, but it's the path. If you don't go to college, you can't get a job. Well, that's what we've always been told, right? So you either go to college or join the military. You know, used to be, used to be going to the trade school, but boy, those really disappeared for a long time. There weren't even many trade schools around anymore. But I suspect that you're going to see a lot of people. There's a reason for this, because there's some economies coming up that they think will change the way that people work. We'll talk a little bit about that a little bit later. But anyway, so this has gone, it's gone, uh, it's gone mainstream now. They're everywhere, everybody's doing it, so it's not novel. And I think because of that, you're going to see the standard business practices that are going to happen out of this, which is they're going to get formalized, everything's going to become measurable, it'll be a common language, everything will be standardized eventually, and so, and so on. So that's one of the biggest things that's changed, yes. What is a co-work space? A co-work space or where, where you just show up, you, you rent an office or rent a table or something, but there's no expectation. They don't try to accelerate your business. It's simply the ability for you to not have to work at your house. So um, a lot of those are like um, WeWorks, which is down in San Jose, um, InnoWest. There's a lot of them running around, and you can rent a conference room. You can, rent a, you can get a conference room, a desk, an office, and they have different tiers as you work through there. But there's no expectations of accelerating your business or doing anything. It's just some people can't work at home. So these people figure out how to make money doing that. Now I've helped convert several of those from co-work spaces to incubators because they're a very natural fit. Okay, the second thing is the bar has been raised. So I told you about the start of where we, I had where we got our $25 million on our first pitch. One pitch and we got funded for $25 million. We were barely, we, had a, a minimally viable product. We had an MVP. That's about all we had. Um, and I'm talk a little bit about what those kind of things mean, and we'll talk about that. So this is kind of your your uh, the pathway from the beginning, from the, the beginning of the company where you have the idea creation phase, market entry, growth, and IPO acquisition. This is a standard business model, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how that comes into play and how the bar has been changed. So we're going to talk about the first piece here, which we call incubate the idea. And 
It's also sometimes referred to as the friends and family round. Does everybody know what the three F's stand for in the Valley? Who wants to rattle off and off? There you go. Okay, you got the three F's. Sometimes referred to as bootstrapping. But the most important part of all of this is when we got our $25 million, we were bought right here in, in the stage of this. We had an MVP, mentally viable product. It worked, it did basically what it was supposed to. It was by no means had all the features that were going to come. Um, and we got $25 million. That will not happen today to anybody unless they've already had a successful exit, they know the investor they're talking to, and that investor is investing in that individual and not the company. They just know that this person is going to be successful. Then it happens. Other than that, those days are gone. So when we talk about that, in this stage, there's a variety of things that need to happen. You need to understand the customer. You need to have a plan. You need to know what it's going to cost to execute that plan. And the most important one, you have to be able to communicate it intelligently to someone who wants to listen, like potentially a partner, an investor, maybe even a potential founder or teammate or so forth. And that's actually a tough one because a lot of the startups I work with, they're, they're, young, they're very young. You know, they're between 22 and 26. They've either held maybe one or no jobs, you know, or you know, so forth. They just don't have the experience to know what's going on. So anyway, today, that is expected for you to be done before you even walk out the door and look to talk to an investor at all. So as, a, as an entrepreneur, you're expected to pay for this phase right here. Um, and that kind of becomes your skin in the game or your commitment to it, how long and what it took you to get there. Now, once you get through that, you're going to come up here and talk to an angel investor. So you have to have a strategy plan to be a prototype. So that's one of the areas where it's changed a lot. I have folks come out and say, hey, I need a million dollars, I need a million five. But they're not far enough down the road to talk to any investors that are in the position to give them a million, million five yet because they haven't quite got to what's necessary to check the box. So you can't go talk to these people over here until you validate if you have the right product at the right price. So the bar has just been raised across the board. And here in the Valley, it's extremely high. Um, just because, again, choice. There's a lot of choices, you know. Um, so anyway, so that's one of the biggest things that change is the expectations and, and, and the bar. And they, you know, everybody expects you to show up. Okay, so one of the questions I got, number three on the list is global teams. I get a lot of discussions as well, I heard you have, you can't. We just talked about how investors draw a circle around for 100 miles, and if you're not in that, you don't get funded. Okay, well those times are changing a little bit. There are companies out there in, in investor networks and investor organizations that are focused on the global aspect of it. And there is probably no software company right now who's not de whose developers are in the United States. They're more likely going to be in Macedonia, Ukraine, Russia, and, and, and India still. Um, so, so I was going to ask, can I have global teams? And the answer is yes, you can now. It's accepted, nobody then thinks twice about it. In fact, there's probably, it's really funny, most of the Indian companies I work with, there's probably not an Indian company that's operating here in the States who doesn't have a cousin or a brother or an uncle who's, who's doing all the programming back in India. So these are just these are just standard business practices now. Everybody expects it. Uh, it's not uncommon. What you do have to have here, though, is your business unit and probably a U.S. rollout plan. But your team doesn't have to, does not have to be here anymore. Yes? What about, like, development agreements with the people overseas? Don't you see that contract? being required to make sure that the U.S. company owns the LP. Yeah, there's that. There's always a requirement to, to understand who that is. So in many cases, particularly like I say with the folks that come from India, those tend to be family members, and they put those together pretty straightforward. Uh, but a lot of times it is just a third party that they went out and get it. So they do look for the contracts to get together. So that actually tops on a whole different topic. I'll touch base for a little bit. Probably the weakest uh, link of all startups is paperwork. You know, they'll be running around for two years and everybody's got an agreement of what they think they have their number signed. But they've all had a handshake and had a discussion of what, how many shares they're all getting. So startups run around forever with no paperwork in place, no actual signed agreements. Everybody got a, a warm fuzzy of who, how the connections in work. And that's good because most people in the business work knows you really don't need agreements for anything. Agreements only work when there's a problem. As long as everybody's going fine and everybody makes money, nobody cares a lot what an agreement says. They just move down the road smiling and everything's good. But as soon as there's a stumble or a trip up, oh boy, that agreement suddenly becomes worth its weight in gold. Anyway, well, we'll talk about a whole different topic. We'll spend an afternoon talking about what startups aren't doing in the world of documenting contracts and paperwork. 
All right, so let's talk about this global thing. So one of the things of GOJ Group that we believe is we believe that the future of innovation will be driven by private investment through shared risk ecosystems and global teams. And that's where that global team is not only expect, you know, accepted now in many cases, a lot of people are looking for you to have a global team so you can have a better reach and not be limited to any one particular region or so forth. Although if you get stuck in one region, the United States is a pretty good region to get stuck in. We spend a lot of money anyway. So anyway, so this is your classic poster. Anybody who's been in the Valley has seen these stupid folk posters all over the Valley. They change every couple of years. They put new names on. They take new names off. But the point being is the Silicon Valley is the benchmark for our ecosystem. So let's talk about the shared risk ecosystem because it is critical. And we're going to talk about that here in a few minutes. So if you take a look at the definition of a startup in Lean, is anybody familiar with Lean Startup? It's the book that came out a few years ago that became the new buzzwords for what before it used to be called the seven good things to be doing or it was called smart business practices or whatever. Now it's called lean, like lean startup. So lean startup has a philosophy and this is how they define a startup. A startup is a human institution designed to deliver a new product, service, or service and conditions of uncertainty. Now let's think about that. Does it know where it is to say you're starting a company? Okay. The startup model does not require you to have a company. All it requires you to have a company is so you can give stock to an, an investor if they want shares, which is what they're going to probably do. So one of the biggest changes that's in the startup model, which is now, a, uh, we define that as one of the three business models. Traditional, traditional business model based on good old debt growth. We all know that. We learned it through school. You've got a franchise model where you buy a, fran you buy a, you buy a brand, you buy logistics, you wear the hat, follow the checkbox, you'll probably make money, and now you have a startup model. And the startup model is uniquely different because it's got an investor exit, it's explosive growth, and you're probably going to end your business in an acquisition. 93% of all businesses in a startup model are acquisitions. So if you're trying to go from day one to go for an IPO, then I hope you're in Silicon Valley, because they're probably the only ones that can invest this, hang around long enough to go IPO. So those are the things that are going to change. So it's a human institution. Human institution is interesting. Because the secret of starting a, uh, a startup is not to do it on your own, is to bring a lot of people together, give them all their equity, play the game right, know how to do it, get the thing launched in three years, get acquired in four, and be done, and move on to the next project. Now that is a completely foreign business model around the world in most cases. An example, I'll use Saudi as an example because they're a very good, uh, they're quite different than the way we operate, but they're not that much different than the rest of business. So things in Saudi, for example, here in the Valley, if you haven't failed, if you haven't tried hard enough, you know? So everybody likes to say there's a common term here that if you haven't failed, you haven't tried, you haven't failed big, you haven't tried hard enough. Okay, and so we wear those as a badge of honor that says, hey, I, we've been there. Well, around the world, you know, how many people are, are recently from a foreign country? Not not born or made here for everybody here. Okay, well, around the world, failure is still four-letter wording. It's 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 fail fail. It's just bad. You know, if you fail a lot of countries in Saudi, if you're in Saudi, you have a major failure in business. You may not get as many invites from the family to come back to dinner later because <laughs> a lot of countries around the world still don't look at failure as, oh, that's an honor. <laughs> that's a failure. <laughs> it's not an honor. So anyway, so there's a lot of things going around to make that change. But the key here is this human institution. That's what makes it, uh, that's what makes it active, okay? Any questions on that? We can spend a lot of time talking about ecosystems and how they work and that. We're going to touch base a little bit here in a couple, a little later down. So, Number four, investors are more connected and have better access to information. Everybody's connected. Uh, our very first deal we did at South Valley Angels came out of, out of uh, Ohio, uh, the university, through an organization called Cincy Tech, which is a local incubator that gets government funding to help launch startup <coughs> companies. And they're, they're pitching their their, uh, the guy was pitching his product to Cincy Tech, and they go, oh, I see you live in Fremont, California. Isn't that kind of by San Jose? And he goes, yeah, it's real close. He says, oh, well, you need to talk to Gary. I get a call from him an hour later, we funded him, Cincinnati had no chance because he didn't want to live in Cincinnati, he wanted to stay in Fremont. But to get the money from Cincinnati, he would have had to move his business to Cincinnati because they get government funding. And a lot of incubators and startups are, are incubators are like that. If they get government funding, you have to stay in there because it's about just creating jobs. Um, so anyway, so as soon as that done, they came on board, we, we ended up funding him, and uh, they actually couldn't play in the game at all. But investors are very closely connected. It's all about networking. There's not very much competition, and that's another thing that's different in the world. In, in other parts of the world, the investors all compete. It's my idea, I want to keep it, it's a great, I'm going to invest it, I'm going to be the one that did the good thing. But the reality is, it's not a competitive environment. Any investor who wants to do that won't be an investor for long. Why invest $100 in a company where I can get 10 of my friends and we can all invest 10K, and if we lose, we lose 10K. 
I'm not sitting there you know, with 100K out of my pocket now. So it's, it's not a competitive environment. So they're all connected and so forth. And that's how a lot of deals get done, is through connections. Rarely is it one investor, unless you're talking to a VC, who's got a $5 billion fund and they just write you a check for whatever they want. Any questions there? Okay. Oh, that's what I forgot here. The second one here. They're connected and they're really good. So be prepared because they know what they're doing. In fact, they're certain, when, you start, when you start making claims and going through your slides, I can guarantee you two of those investors will have their phone under their desk and they're Googling what you just said. <laughs> well, I don't have any competitors like that. Wow, I just found six. You know, uh, anyway, so they're, they're very well connected and they know what's going on. Okay, now we're going to talk about this, um, this ecosystem. One of the most important things that a startup can do in the ecosystem is to understand how, what it is and use it and leverage it and make use of it and know how to play the game. Just like anything else, that's why people go to business schools to learn how to play the game in a traditional business model. Uh, you need to understand how to play the game in this new startup business model as well. So let's talk about this. This is kind of how we define a shared risk ecosystem. We believe it starts here with an innovation center, an incubator, or whatever it is. It has to at least have investors. Because without investors, it can't even get started. But if all it has is investors, it'll probably fail. And that's one of the big problems in the Middle East, Saudi, and those kind of areas. And some of the other countries that are just getting into it. They got a lot of investors, but they don't know what to do. And all they've got is investors who put money in here, but then the companies don't do anything, so they'll spend the money. So the next thing you have to have is some resources, like mentors, leaders, some folks with some gray hair, so they understand how to do things, to work with those folks. You know, then you have to have what we call enablers. These are things like research and development, coders, um, people that might do branding, do flyers, do brochures, and so forth and so on. Now, one of the things we do uh, at GLJ Group is we actually set this up. So we're building this whole ecosystem in Saudi Arabia right now. We're connecting all the VCs, all the mentors, all the companies, and we're dialing all that up between Dubai and all the areas that are over there. So we're trying to build that right now. So what we do is we, we do training for all the aspects. We train corporates how to work in this environment. Um, we train investors over there because investors don't know how to invest in this. They're all foiled. They're banking, business, real estate. They're not starting investors. So we build these up. Now for businesses, for those of you in here that might have your own businesses, there, there is a way to work with them in this space. And so here's how local business could contribute to this space. So let's say you're a branding company or you do business cards and so forth and so on. So the way you can do that, you could work with a startup that comes in and says, well, hey, I'll do your business cards for you at no cost or at 10 cents on the dollar or something under the condition that we write an agreement that says that when you can actually afford it, I become your supplier of business cards and flyers and yada, yada, yada for the next five years, let's say. You know, so now you can work these up. Same thing with manufacturing, same thing with coders. So the people that have tools that they can bring to the table, you can work real good in this environment and do it early on. So if you spend $50,000 a year on marketing, for example, why not take $10,000 of that, set it aside, and do free business cards for long startups, a few startups, and so forth. At the end of the day, you'll know that out of that $10,000 you spent, it actually went to companies that are probably going to come to you later on and need to get something for it. So that's kind of the deal we have here. So I work with a lot of startups that we bring in here uh, to have a stream of lens. Why? Because of Eventually, those startups are going to start having revenues. They're going to need to worry about taxes. They're going to need to worry about stuff. So we bring them in here so we can start with it to, you know, and grow through at the end of the day. You know, start when they're young and then have you know, seven Googles under your belt before you know what's going on. So there's a lot of ways to work with this community for business and everything. We, we have um, subject matter experts within GLJ Group that can sit down with businesses and explore and understand how you can tap into this new market that's coming. And it is coming. If you're not getting five years, if you're not working in the startup market in some manner or another, you're probably missing a huge opportunity that this is going to be coming from a variety of ways across the board. Because there's this thing that's coming out of that market that's also called the shared economy. Have you heard that term? Okay, well that's coming fast. And as a business, if you're not learning how to tap into that, your competitors are going to run past you so fast because the shared economy explodes overnight. Well, we'll talk a little bit about that here in the slides. All right. What a coincidence. Understanding emerging trends. So in the startup world, and, in, and with entrepreneurs and investors, everybody thinks about well, startup trends. Oh, yeah, yeah, we're talking tech. Well, maybe. So it's important. What technologies are coming down the road for you as a business that you can either bring into your business that will have value to you that won't? Um, and with technology, um, artificial intelligence. So I worked with a company just three weeks ago that's building a platform that's going to do some analytics and do a bunch of business and business type stuff. And I said, well, I don't see anything here where you're, you have any machine learning or any AI coming into your, so into your software. He says, oh, well, that's coming. We know that's going to be the next step. I said, well, if that's your next step, then you might as well close your doors now because you already missed the boat because everybody else has already put in their product today. 
So if you don't have AI and machine learning in your software today, if you're doing any kind of smart analytics or any business to business stuff, there is no, oh, that, we're going to do that next because everybody else is doing it. So that's an example where they didn't follow the trends. They thought AI was going to be a little further down the road and they were going to slowly work there. So they were, they were going to be off the track from day one. Same thing like virtual reality and so forth and so on. Where is virtuality going to pay off? You know, how could you work that into your business? So you're going to start seeing a lot of things. I already I just saw a demo for real estate agents where you can just take your VR headgear and I can put the VR headgear and I can walk through any house they've got in there. I just walk around, I can look out the carpet, I can look up the ceiling, I can look around corners. It was, it was amazing. Um, I don't have to leave my room, just put on my VR set, put my phone in there and boom, I can walk through 12 houses by noon. Yeah, so a lot of these things are coming. How do you use this? <clears throat> autonomous machines. You've got connected cars. You've got the smart house. You've got the I. Got the other. Autonomous machines are coming. How do you tap that into it? And this isn't simply from just an entrepreneur side, but these are from existing business sides. These are things coming. You have to figure out why. Wow, you know, if we can figure out and get it coming into a bid with a couple startups that are already doing that, man, we can pass our competitors real quick. So small businesses have to have to start moving that way. Now the next thing I talk about the shared economy. So not many people heard the shared shared economy. So the shared economy is what many are projecting. They're saying that by 2020, 40% of all U.S. adults will be working in the shared economy. That means every other person you pass on the street self-employed, or, 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 or very or majorly self-employed, maybe not completely. So what does that mean? So the shared economy was a philosophy. So think about so, uh, social networking. Okay, when Facebook came out, that was a very new, disrupting thing. Everybody knew that if we could get a billion people in one place, we could probably make money. But nobody really knew how. But anyway, these things, MySpace and they all, all this stuff started coming along, and they validated that social networking as a business is a viable business model. Now Facebook knows how to make money. YouTube hasn't figured it out yet. Twitter's starting to. Snapchat's getting there. So, so these things came. Now, the shared economy is the same way. Two companies have now validated that the shared economy can work, and people will use it, and it can be, you can generate the money. Do you know who those two companies are? Uber. Airbnb and Uber. Uber, exactly. So they both show that the shared economy can work, that people are going to So I know a gentleman that makes about $12 million a year, really doesn't even work, he just makes money. Um, and he's an Uber driver. Why is he an Uber driver? Because he does meetings, he lives in Morgan Hill, and he does meetings in San Francisco. So every meeting he goes on, he opens up his um, Uber driver, who's going from San Jose to San Francisco, he picks him up, he drives the car pool in all the way to San Francisco. He makes 85 bucks. Doesn't care if he can't squat about the money. Then when he's coming back, he finds somebody in San Francisco who wants to go to South San Jose. He picks him up and he drives a carpool lane all the way back from San Francisco. He will not go to San Francisco for a meeting if he can't pick up an Uber. Because he will not sit driving for three hours. It's not going to happen. It won't happen. Anyway, so this is the shared economy. So there, I, I work with startups that have shared economy from everything you can imagine. So what a shared economy means is that you're going to wake up in the morning and say, all right, got to go I got a doctor's appointment in San Jose. Okay, I'll, 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 I'll do an Uber drive up to San Jose. You get to San Jose, you do your doctor's appointment, you're done, and you go, ah, it's kind of nice, I think I'll have lunch. So you're gonna have lunch. I look at, I might have eight or nine different apps online that are shared economy apps. And let's say I'm a photographer. I work with a company that does professional phone photography and video. So for, and they come with like adapters and lenses on their camera. So let's say you and your significant other is on the beach in Hawaii, and you're going, this, look at that, the sun's perfect. I'd love to have a good video. You hit that app, somebody who, who happens to be in that app says, oh, I'm five minutes away, I'll be right there. Boom, they come here, they take a 30 second video of you real quick, they send it to you now, you pay them as $20, and that person moves on and you've got a lifetime moment you would have never captured any, any other way. And that's a business. So now, these are all businesses that people will then get up in the morning and do their entire day, run their errands and get paid for all that because they'll go here and Uber, they'll go there and they'll take pictures, they'll go here and walk a dog, They'll go here and do this, and at the end of the day, they show up back home, and they made $800 that day, uh, working for nine different companies. That is the shared economy. So if you're not looking at a, your businesses right now, and can you tap into a shared economy? So what if you didn't have sales reps, and you just tapped into the shared economy into your sales organization, and let the entire world out there running around the Bay Area? So how about, here's, a, here's, a, here's another example of shared economy. So there's, a, there's an app running around out there now, where if I have that app in my pocket, um, I get my phone vibrates, I get up and go, oh, I need the price of bananas. Oh, I'm in Safeway right now. I go over, I take a picture here, here's the price of bananas, do my send them. So I just made a dollar off that from that person who needed some information on the price of banana. So I did that for them. So now I'm at the store. So while I'm at the store, I can make money while I'm doing my shopping. So I don't need the sales reps anymore. I can now work this through a shared economy and create my own little private app that just goes out there and now everybody shares the wealth as things happen. 
So these are the kind of things that are coming to share the rest. So it's understanding the emerging trends and how you can tap into those. Now, not of all of them are economic trends. Some of them are trends within economies. So the biggest, one of the biggest things going on right now is I work with a lot of startups that are doing loyalty programs. New methods of how I can lock you in and keep you loyal to that company. And I find that interesting because I already believe that the loyalty programs are dead. There's no loyalty to anything. And as a company, why would I want to have a loyalty program to do? I really don't want a loyalty program. I just want to make a lot of money every month, right? So what if, I don't care if I have the same 10 people that come in and spend X amount of dollars, <coughs> or whether I've got 100 people that come in and spend a dollar. I really don't care. I just want my $100 at the end of the month, right? So I believe the loyalty is gone. The loyalties came out really well with the credit card where I have one device, that one thing I can use everywhere, like a credit card and get a little bit of money back. But the loyalty apps are now is trying to get people to stay locked into your store and so forth. And I personally don't think the millennials are loyal to anything. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, if, if, I, if I'm going to go buy something, I'm the same. I'm terrible for marketing. I have no brand loyalty whatsoever. If I'm going to go buy a, a TV, my last TV maybe a Samsung, but does that mean I'm just going to go down and automatically buy another Samsung? No, I'm going to go online and find the best TV at the best price and I'm going to buy that TV. I don't care about it, you know, as long as it, it rated well and so forth. So I think you're seeing a lot of this. So there's only, in my opinion, there's only two companies that have part. Do you let me know what the two most brand loyal companies are in the world? And they both happen to be American. That's one. There's one that's actually even scarily more brand loyal than Apple, and that's Harley B. Harley Davidson. You find a Harley rider, there are no people in the second. They're just too little things. You know, and they are no different than, than, than with Apple. And it doesn't matter. They do not have to produce the best product. They don't have to do squat. They just keep putting on doing. And I, 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 I got guys who got six Harleys, and they paid thirty thousand dollars for each one of them. You know, this one. that's a new one. <laughs> okay, whatever. You know, and Apple's the same way. The phones don't even have to change. And we buy them every year. Oh, they're new. It's got a seven. I go grab one. You know, oh, it's got my other one. It's got my other one. Well, it's got my other one. And so I'm going to do this. So one of the things that happens out of that. So how did gentlemen show me this? So in our minds, we can rationalize anything we want. We can make anything go the way we want. We can always do it. You know, we can rationalize why I need to have that brand new phone that's no different than the phone I had last year, but now it's new, so I can get it. Why I have to have that sports car? But I'm going to show you. He showed me a different way to do this. So that's how he spells rationalize. <laughs> uh, so we can always convince ourselves in our mind why to do what it is we want to do and why it's important. Where'd my clicking go? I got this connected. <laughs> <laughs> got to stay in practice. Football season's coming. Let me show you my remote hand. Okay. So it's important to understand the emerging trends. Not just how can you incorporate technology and are there new e economic models coming that are different. But are there trends that are happening and should I be trying to even go down this road from a market perspective? All right, so <laughs> startups. This is a classic one. This is simply for only for the entrepreneurs in this room. So I have to sit down with them. You do not get credit anymore for having a great user experience and a great UI. It's amazing how many companies that I work with still try to sell me, we've got an amazing UI. And that would have been good five years ago. Now it's expected. So you get no benefit for a good UI, but you do get beat up for not having a good UI. Okay. So, so anyway, so you can't take credit for that now. The other thing you can't really take credit for anymore is, oh, we do 3D, we, we have uh, big data analytics. We're going to learn information that nobody else is going to know. Great. If you're doing a SaaS platform, I expect that. It's, 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 not a benefit, it's not a feature that I, oh, wow, data. No. So UX and big data, no benefit for those. If you show up without that, then you might as well just go home. See, I just want to get that out there. Everything's to get credit for that now. No? Okay. Master, faster, better, faster, cheaper. As far as startups and ideas, it's much easier to sell than disruptive. Uh, why? Because everybody understands it. If you come back and say, this thing takes 10 hours, ours takes 10 seconds, this is $100 million, ours is a dollar, I can measure those, I can look at those, it's easy to take a look at and say, wow, there's absolute benefit. 99% of the apps that are coming out and the things that are coming down the road in the future are going to simply be better, faster, cheaper. Because today we have a pretty good world. We can pretty much do everything today we want to do. There's very few things that are going to come down the road that we cannot do today in some manner. Now, it may be easier and simpler and integrated on a one little app and one little click and I don't have to go through all these hoops to make it happen, but I can still do it today. 
Okay. <clears throat> so when everybody wants to run out and try to create something disruptive, disruptive is the hardest thing to sell. It's the hardest thing to understand. It's the hardest thing to get invested. And it's generally extremely hard to figure out how to make money from it. Now, once you get all that in place and it all works, then it's huge. It is truly disruptive. Um, so let's look at some of the things. I consider one of the, still one of the most amazing sales pitches for one of the most disruptive things that ever came out was, again, just a business model. It wasn't anything in particular. But I just thought this guy had been an amazing salesman. And that was the first bank. Can you imagine going down the sidewalk back in the day and saying, hey, I had a great idea. I'll give you all your money. I'll hold it for you. Just come on, let me know when you want some. I'll, I'll give you some. I'll give you some power to you. And I'll even give you more money for letting me hold on to your money. You know, tough sales pitch. Okay, microwave. So I was kind of in the early days of the microwave. I was a kid, and I still remember our parents going, what is a microwave for? I got a stove. I got an oven. I can boil. I don't need this. Oh, my God, I'd starve without one. You know? you know, so these are disruptive things that have come along, but they're very difficult, they're very hard to get off the ground, so don't try to convince yourself that, you know, it, 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 I'm disruptive. Better, faster, cheaper. I'm not convinced the helmet is the right approach here, that started up, I might think of a better, but, but he's trying. It's better, faster, cheaper, I got a new idea. See, this is another problem we see with startups and apps, is they all try to solve the problem of the consumer or the user. In this case, I'm trying to solve the problem of the user. Okay, I'm not going to fix this thing. I'm assuming that's the thing. So I'm going to do this. But what happens in most of those cases? I ask. That's so why I always ask the startup when we're doing this. It's probably a SaaS model, software as a service. So is the consumer paying you anything? Oh no, no, we give it to them for free. Then why are you solving their problem? Why don't you solve the problem of the people that are paying you? You know, it's like oh, that's novel. <laughs> okay, so we, you know, these little things like that. So it's a matter of understanding how to do your modeling. But faster. Better, faster, cheaper is always an easier way to go because it's manageable. And that's going to be 99% of what comes down the feed. And that's what automation and AI is going to do for us. They're just going to automate a lot of things. They're going to take functions we do on a regular basis now. They're just going to automate them. You know, I love the new one, the new uh, chatbots that are out right now. The ones you know that you know it used to be when you answer the phone, you can hear, sort of hear that click, click, click. Oh hi, you know. Now it's like, oh I'm sorry, I was adjusting my headset. Have you heard that one yet? It's like wow, I, I actually that was pretty funny. You, two, you guys ought to get better headsets because none of you can keep them on. You're adjusting your phone. <laughs> but that's just a chat bot. You make the phone call and then click to a live person. And, and that's how they try to get through that. Oh, I'm sorry. You know, with that, hello, hello, hello. Oh, I'm sorry. No, you weren't. <laughs> anyway. All right. Better, faster, cheaper. Okay. Research and development. Now, this is kind of a biggie. So, um, research and development is coming out of the corporate. Virtually all corporations now have investment arms. Uh, anybody, if you're a corporate one cor 1,000, definitely. Um, so that's what I did in Saudi Arabia. So Saudi Telecom wanted to get into the startup business and, and so forth and so on. So there's been a way. The first way we're doing what Saudi Telecom is doing, which is that corporations are not in building incubation, incubators, accelerators, corporate innovation centers, whatever they want to call them. And it was an idea was to bring a bunch of people, a bunch of fish into one place so I can find the two that I like, get my technology out of it, and move up. Well, now they're starting to find that that probably wasn't from a from a cost perspective, that's not the right way to go because incubators and accelerators are pretty expensive to run and they don't have the same profitability and cash flow that the other business units have as large corporations kind of hold you responsible for that says, you're not making any money this quarter, what's going on? Um, and the problem with incubators and accelerators, they don't make a lot of money, then one of their companies will exit and they'll make $100 million. And now they're good, now they're set, and now they've got cash flow and they'll get it and so forth and so on. So what they're doing now is they're just rolling out, they're giving startups 25K here, 25K here. So rather than spending $250,000 in R&D from some internal engineers, they're going to give that $25,000 to 10 different startups who are working in that space. It's a real easy, it's an easy win for them. If none of them come up with something, hey, no biggie, they were going to probably blow $250,000 with their own engineers anyway. Um, so it's become a model now that's really getting out there and it can be a, a, a really a interesting to go. So I've got a lot of partners now that work specifically with their with corporations who say, hey, I'm looking for this kind of technology. They push it down the pipe, we go back and say, hey, we've got four of those, and we push the startups back up to them. Um, and say, here you go, where do these work for you? So, corporations are coming out, it's, it's just becoming much more, I mean, any company is limited by X number of engineers they can afford to hire. But I could easily go out and do a blast in, in, in any kind of a social network and say, hey, I'm looking for great ideas, you know, next Sunday we're going to kick off and we're going to do a hackathon on how to figure out how to do this. 80 companies, 80 startups will show up. That's the result. They'll spend their three, four days doing their hackathon. They'll come out and say, great idea, we like it. Move down the road. So you're seeing a lot of that happening. A completely different model. All right. 
At the end, though, of all the things, some things never change. Like one, startups never have money. <laughs> and so they're always looking for money. That never changes. And the pain of looking for money is the same as it was before. It doesn't change either. The downside is that there's more entrepreneurs looking for more money than there ever has been before because now people are coming out of high school and it's, it's a career path. Entrepreneurism is now a career path that people are being accepted. If my, so my oldest daughter is 29. If she had come out and when she came out of life and said, hey, I'm not going to go to college, I'm going to go start up. I'd say, no problem, you start off with anything you want after college. Yeah. And so we did that, pushed her through college. But now that, that conversation doesn't happen anymore. People are moving on the road. I, knew, I know a gentleman, he's 21 years old. He's been the uh, CEO of three companies. Um, he wrote his first book when he was 18. It was called Uncollege. College <laughs> is not the future to wealth and success. Uh, anyway, <coughs> so there's a lot of these things are going on. So what never changes? Money. So I'm going to show you a couple statistics here. So it's always like to wrap up on something kind of fun. All right. Here are basic findings. This is taken from a company called Doxan, who tracks all sorts of statistics all over the place. Here in the Valley, they track a lot of startup, investor, high-tech stuff. So this is, on the average companies, this is an average over the, in 2016 for companies that went out and looked for funding. And here is what you can look for. On average, the, the successful company contacted 58 investors. They had 40 investor meetings. They raised $1.3 million on average. And it took 12 and a half weeks to close from the time the investor told them they were interested. So now when I talk to people, they say, man, I'm struggling getting me funding. Well, have, you, have you talked to 30 uh, investors yet? Oh, heck no. Well, then you're, you're just barely halfway there. And remember, you know, every no is one step closer to a yes. <laughs> Who was that? One of the Zig Ziglar was not one of his big famous things. I don't know. It was one of those stupid lame things on his back when the sales games. I still like the one though with that movie way back when Glenn Gary or Glenn Ross. Coffee's for closers. <laughs> back away from the coffee. That's only for closers. Okay. So this is what it takes to get funded. 58 emails, 12 and a half weeks, and 40 meetings. And here is the depressing part. <laughs> All the months and months you spent on your pitch deck, they only spent three minutes and 44 seconds looking at it. <laughs> and you probably spent 3.44 months working on it. But it is still critically important. It has to be there. You can't get there without it. And the average pitch deck was 19.2 pages, just for reference. Seems kind of long to me, but uh, they're probably employing the Guy Kawasaki one word and 82 font on each page. <laughs> which is a nice format. I do believe in simple, in, in simple. The problem is what happens with that format, I'll just do my quick formatting, is, is when you do that format and you go and pitch it, the investors go, oh, great deck, you know, great, great president. Can you leave me a soft copy? Oh, absolutely. So you, you give me your thumb drive, right? Just like a good interpreter who's always prepared. He's got nine in his pocket. I've got one of those. Uh, just like a music business, you know, if you don't have your recordings in your back pocket on your cassette or your MP3 or whatever you got, you're wrong. Okay, so you got to have your pitch deck and all that stuff with you. So you go and give that to them. So like those investors, I get up Friday morning, I take my stack of decks I'm going to look at today, got my coffee, I get to yours, and I got one word on each page and a bunch of pictures. I go, I have no idea what this is about anymore. Because without the verbiage and the person pitching it, the pitch deck's useless. Anyway, make sure you send your pitch deck in the right format for the right people that can actually understand what's there. Okay, that is it. So those were the 10 things I thought I would talk about that you should probably know as, a, as, a, as an entrepreneur or a startup or anybody that's interested in startup industry. So pretty quiet. We've got a lot of time now, so lots of time for questions. Any, any questions? Yeah, go ahead. What about safes versus convertible notes versus angel funding? What, what do you see in trends on safes and kisses? And you know, it's interesting. Safes seem to be really hot there for a while. Now, it seems like people are swinging back to convertible note. And I don't understand that, really, because I... Okay, now I don't know this for a fact, but my guess is that convertible notes arose because they came out of the banking industry, because everybody that did those were ex-bankers and financial people, which is probably why convertible notes started with a date, because loans are based by, I got a 12-month loan, an 18-month loan, a 24-month loan, a 36-month loan, so I suspect the convertible notes came out from the banking industry and said, oh, well, it's an 18-month convertible note, you know, convertible note. So they generally have a date tied to them. Now, the problem with the date is that if you're in research and development in the early stages, you don't know what you don't know. And therefore, that date, any, anybody here working in engineering or a development process, if an engineer told you it's going to take a month, it's three. <laughs> <laughs> just, just rule of thumb. If you said one, it's three. Okay? So everybody does this. So what happens on a convertible note is you're still developing your product, you're building the early stage, and now all of a sudden that 18 months is here, it's due, and it's tomorrow. But you're not done yet. You're not 
ready to go to that next step and get more funding and you're not there. So now everybody's upset because that's a legal d document, which means that debt is due tomorrow. And as an investor, I expect you to give me my money back and my six and a half percent or whatever that interest rate was tied to that convertible note. Then a lot of folks a couple years ago started saying, boy, why should we force this cliff that comes up? Because it, it doesn't, it's not the end of the day. What it means, the investors now have to spend $20,000, turn the legal team back on, do another agreement, do another note, redo that, throw some sort of a penalty. <coughs> you know, it just gets ugly and it has to happen. Okay. Now, with the safe note, what those are, those are generally tied to says your next round of funding. So if that would be 15 months, 14 months, 16 months, 17 months, 19, there's no cliff. But there is an expectation that that safe note is going to go on, not going to go on for five years. Anyway, so it's, I've seen people go back to the verbal, and I'm not really sure, because myself personally, I've always liked safe notes. So there must have been some people, that something's going on where people have probably pushed that end date on a, on a safe note farther than investors were comfortable. At least with a convertible note, the investor knows a decision happens on this date, one way or another. So I'm not sure. How about you, Jeff? Are you, what are you seeing in that? Well, I think a lot of Y Combinator companies are seeing a lot of safes, so they're very popular from what we're seeing from those companies that are going in there, but I think we see the same trend in the <coughs> We say it's good for the entrepreneur because it's no debt. <coughs> yeah, exactly. But it doesn't give the investor protection. I think Silicon Valley is looking to hedge risk, and so they're realizing that the convertible debt is going to protect the investors. So yeah. Yeah, but you can still put protection in there from the fact that yeah. you still have what you have. But there's no dates to it. So if they're, you know, if they're in the hard dates, they can slow. There so it could be. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah, it's just a trend I see kind of going back to convertibles. Yeah. Uh, have safes been adopted by international investors? They have. In fact, when I was in Dubai, so the legal team we work with over in Dubai is called Smeva. S N E L A W, really sharp. They, they're all U.S. trained. They've all been here in the valley. They've got all their connections. You know, they're connected to all the, the big groups over here. And when I was doing our talk with them over there, they were so proud that they had just gotten their first safe note. <laughs> and it was still in English. It hadn't been converted to Arabic yet. It was that new. <laughs> they said, yeah, it's still in English. You know? <laughs> anyway, so yeah, they are. They're adopting them. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, when you talk about, you know, Strategies for a startup, everything changing, trying to get them. You know, it all felt very heavily weighted towards your startup or product, or whatever being software. Now, especially as a former hardware engineer, um, last thing, I understand that you know goes with the trends. Um, but lest we forget, everything still does run on hardware at the end of the day. So that's true. Software sitting on its own doesn't do anything. What uh, what do we? Uh, to do to convince people who are all in this seem to be this mindset of you know how it applies to a software model even if it's a concept that isn't that is you know technology uh -huh. independent like I said just sure the, sure okay the, I get the feel that. is that it's all software. well to start with the trend is applicable to software and hardware now let's step back and look at what you're talking is more a difference between an investor's mindset and and maybe something else. So in the investor world, and the, the reason they, the software, so the perfect, the perfect company for the startup business model is in fact a software company that is building something that's hot today, yada yada. Now, that's the perfect company. But why do we say software? Because software with a couple cases of top ramen, I can throw 60K, a couple of coders in an apartment in Sunnyvale, a couple of cases of top ramen and come back in three months and I do that with a product or I don't. If I don't, you know, I cut my losses, I get another case of Top Ramen, and we go do it again. Um, but so hardware always has that, that bubble over it. And you're right, though, at the end of the day, software all runs on hardware by default. So the hardware is important, but the trends are important. From a hardware perspective, what you've got to keep up with is ensure that you're incorporating the right software trends into your hardware. Because very little hardware now comes without software. It used to be a lot of hardware had no software in it. That was just about everything really happened. If you're not selling a bracket, it's probably got software somewhere in it. You know, nobody ever thought a door lock would have software in it. You know, and some of these things. But it's it's coming. So as a hardware, it's really critical to ensure that you're applying again those right models and stuff into your hardware package that does what the world's going to you know, want to do because it's apps that do drive the world. And so a lot of times I've worked with com companies that had really good apps, and we've actually connected them with a hardware company so they could build the product that would be maximized through what their app was capable of doing. And it was in a robotic environment, which made it kind of an opposite way, rather than I really got a good robot, let's find some smarts to make it work. We found some really good smarts and said, wow, you need to do this, this, and this, which actually had, which actually designed the robot out the other end to make, it, to make the hardware really, really optimized with the software to do it, if that makes sense. So I think it connects. I think it all goes together myself. 
Yeah. Um, so I think second or third slide of yours, uh, you talked about a startup that sold for like twenty-five million dollars of investors, right? What? Uh, how much of user traction you had, and do the investors look for like huge? Well, let's, let's, let's wind that down from the word investors to the specific investor. Okay, so to go talk to an angel investor, you have to have an MVP and IDN and be able to tell yada 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 all that good stuff, right? So now that gets you funded to go to market and so forth. The whole purpose of that second part, the go to market, and the, is, is really to validate you have the right product at the right price. That's all an invest. That's all a VC, which is what you're talking about. That's all a VC is looking for. Looking for is validation. Validation does not mean revenue. It does not mean a lot of things. But it can mean, in the perfect world, the ultimate trump of validating your product is somebody wrote you a check. You know, so money is the trump of that because that validates everything. If somebody, one person wrote you a check, then there's probably a million other people out there that will also write a check. Okay, okay that's, so that's, that trumps all validation. But in many cases, the validation phase is not about creating revenue. In most cases, you will create some revenue. What it's really about, more likely, is you're going to roll out an early adopter program so you can achieve the explosive growth necessary to actually validate the product you have. And I go through this all the time. So now the question is, how many people, users, businesses, partners, entities do you need to have in a go-to-market for you to think that that was a successful go-to-market campaign? So for example, if you're doing an enterprise software, you probably only need three, maybe four, maybe five companies to validate your product. Because once you've got five car corporations in five different verticals, that's probably how 99% of the corporation is going to work around the world. You probably have enough to validate your product. Now, if you're doing a consumer product or a user app, you might need 25 or 30,000 people to be operating your system to give you feedback to show that there's validation of demand. So here's a statistic I always thought was kind of interesting. So when Microsoft came out with Windows 10, like anybody else, they needed an early adopter. So a year before Windows 10 went out, Microsoft made it available to anybody who wanted to test it as an early adopter. Do you know how many people Microsoft felt they needed to run a successful early adopter program? Throw a number out. Okay, I'll give you one. 50 million. They needed 50, they estimated they need 50 million early adopters to validate their product. They actually got a little over 32 million which is considered one of the most successful early adopter programs in the history of, opera of operator system rollouts. They still missed their goal, which is why they had three months of patches right after they released it. But that's okay. That's just the nature of the beast. But that's just give an example. So when you're doing your go-to-market, you need to understand what is a successful market view. Is it 10,000 users, 5,000 customers? Because if you have too small of a number, then you won't get enough feedback to, to really get the right product and validate it and incorporate all the good feedback in. If you have too many, then you're spinning your wheels on excess workload that you may or may not need to do because you don't have any money very much. And then, you know, so, so these are the balances. So that's a big importance to understand what your go-to-market would look like and, and what would be measurable to be a good go-to-market. It's, uh, it's a little tricky because what happens if you go and sell the investors that you're going to get all these people that we give you money that you actually have to do? I know, that's the scary part. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, you said don't go into loan. Uh, how do you do Ah, the classic, how do you hire the, the five-star team, the best of the best, with I'll be able to pay them. <laughs> Is that the question we're kind of asking? <laughs> That's the one I hear a lot. <laughs> it's difficult. So here's a couple of things I've talked about that. Um, so that's one of the advantages of going to a place like incubators and, and, and working within incubators or established uh, ecosystems. Um, is they generally have networks of people that can help you do that. The other thing for those looking for teams, because most of the time you'll never hire, if you're a company like Abbott, Stringham, and Lynch, let's say, they hire people that says, hey, we can pay you this, we're a good established company, been around for a long time, and here's all this great stuff, and here's what we do, and they come here because they're accountants and they're here for a reason. When you're hiring somebody for an, as an entrepreneur and you're hiring stuff for people for your new startup company, you don't necessarily have the roles clearly defined. You need everybody, you have all sorts of openings. I'm flexible, what can you do? You know, um, so what we're really trying to do is you want to sell them on your why. Why are you starting your business, not what you do. In the case of App and Strength, Truman Lynch, and companies like this, they hire, here's what we do, we're looking for somebody to do this, and people that do that sign up. In your case, you're looking for creative, smart people that can fill functional needs of yours as well, but you're much more flexible on how that goes and so forth. So selling them on your why. So if you tell somebody, hey, I make apps, you know, oh, we're going to change the way that people do something. Your why is usually much more powerful what you're doing. So if, if you say, hey, we believe that the future of agriculture is to grow local in a 
consume local, and our whole business model is doing that. And somebody in the room goes, oh, I, I agree, I can't believe we grow everything in Salinas and ship it around the world on a truck and let it ripen in the dark. So, you know, but we do. So I, I totally believe that's the way to go. Hey, I'm starting to come today, want to get on board? Now, you have a common goal and a common vision and a common belief, which everybody's working towards this, rather than I have a job. So use your why, try to think about why it is. And there's a video you can watch called, um, how great leaders aspire or something like that. It's done by a gentleman named Simon Sinek. Simon Sinek, uh, S-I-N-E-K. It's about 18 minutes long. It's an amazing video if you've never watched it. I met him about six years ago when he first started doing his talk. And I think this is now a TEDx. It's got like 7 million views now or something. But it's a great way to understand. And so he talks about people don't buy what you do. They buy why you do it. And Steve Jobs always spoke in that manner. Steve Jobs never sold you a product. He sold you a vision and an idea of this, of this perfection. And inherently, you bought the product because it was, in, it was in expected that, uh, that, that, that perfection was in there. So when Steve Jobs came out, we'll talk about it real quick in a closer. Vision is critical. That's one of the important things that an entrepreneur brings to the table is his vision. So let's talk about the classic from Steve Jobs. Always. Steve Jobs gets in front of the room and he says, we are going to change the way you listen to music, what you want, when you want, where you want, in your pocket. Everybody kind of remember that a little bit? So what do you do next? Hold out an iPod, right? So here's their iPod. Well, those are gone now. It's on your phone. It's part of your iPhone. Nobody buys iPods anymore. Okay? And that was not the vision. That was the device. What was his vision? iTunes, streaming music, app stores. That was his vision, but he needed an iPod because without something to play the music, then having an app store didn't do any good. Much like the discussion of having software with nothing to do it on gets me no hardware, gets me nowhere. So if he had released the app store, it would have been a cool thing to look at, but you can do anything with it. You know, maybe click on it and you know, listen to a 30 second clip of the song. So anyway, so um, the whys and the vision is a key piece of what an entrepreneur brings to the table. That's the easiest way to get your focus, try to find it and understand the why you're doing. And I, when I sit down and work with startups, that's one of the first things I ask them, what's your, what, what's your vision? Because in, in a startup world, you're not selling a product today, you're selling a vision three years down the road. The idea is to, I'm gonna sell it to an investor today so we can build it when it shows up in three years from now, ready to go and it's validated, it's ready to hit the ground. The VCs buy it, you get acquired, and it works, and it does what it's supposed to do. So you're selling a vision three years down the road. You're not selling a product today. So those are big differences. So um, it's about all the time we have there, but uh, you know I've got business cards back there. If you didn't have one, grab one. It's a GLJ group. Give me a call if you're a business and you want to talk about anything. You know, give me a buzz. We'll you know, if, if there's something, it's something okay. else. Just give me an email. Just one. I hope this is okay. Next. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> so Gary said that he worked with startups. Okay. So I happen to know that he has this deal. Okay. And that's why I'm sharing it. Yeah, you share that. Yeah. I don't know how many startups were in there, so maybe sure the best did. thing that you'll get out is me. He did a great job, but what he offers is an extremely competitive deal you because know, I know there's individuals and firms up the Penendo that will charge twenty thousand dollars for what you charge. So tell them what you can do. Okay, so I work I'll sit down. Anybody that comes to any of my events that I do I have a standard package for $750. I'll sit down and we'll run through all your strategic, all your strategies. We'll look at where you, where you are today. Are you on the right path? Are you not on the right path? And what we try to do is we do all that and we use your, your investor pitch deck as your device because if you're, if you're right and you do your deck right, your, your, your pitch deck should be your business plan. You should only need two documents, a pitch deck and financials. If you have right there, I, I, there should be nothing else I need to know about you as a company. Everything I need, I mean your financials tell me what you're gonna do every month, right? So I can just look and say, when do you hire that engineer? Uh, October. So you know, fine. So we will, we'll sit down and work for that seven hundred fifty dollars. For a thousand dollars, for those who are really early, I'll actually help you do your, your cost model. I have a template. We'll fill it out. We'll run through your cost model, get it up and running, and make sure it's all pointed in the right direction. That's a little bit more because cost models by themselves take a few hours. Uh, but anyway, uh, but we, I offer that to anybody who wants to do it. The way that works is the first meeting is about three hours long. We sit down. We look at your whole model, where you are, what's inside your head, who you think you are today. And then we'll go through that, and when we're done with that, you'll leave with a bunch of homework assignments and stuff to do, and you can go and clean up your pitch deck, or in general, build your business plan, fill in the gaps, do whatever your homework assignment says, and then we'll go through probably two or three iterations of that. And when we're done, we should have a very clear, concise package, a plan, an operational plan that covers business development operations and product development. It'll be all laid down, we'll have a funding strategy, we'll know when your exit is, your messaging will be all clean, it'll be concise, and your pitch deck will work for any investor. Uh, 
So anyway, that's what's one of these options. 750. I can guarantee nobody in this valley does that. And I don't take any equity on this first round either. So you know, most of my clients that do this, they'll do it as low as five grand and they want one percent equity. I'm like, man, you're helping the pitch ticket on this. <laughs> you know, that's like yeah, it's like getting married on the first date, you know. It's like, you know, by the third date you're going, wow, that a mistake. But now, now you're attached to the hip. I've got one percent equity, you can't get rid of me, I'm gonna bug you forever, you know. So, so yeah, I have a process. So and also, we also have programs we do with businesses. If businesses just want to sit down and book a couple hours, maybe and sit down and brainstorm what you guys do and how you do it and are there technologies, things that can come in or business models or whatever the case that can maybe come in that might be appropriate for what you're doing. We do those things as well. I have partners that work all the way from the corporate down to you know, and individuals. You know, it doesn't really matter. We can, we can figure out what we need to do. But I think this is an exciting area. There's a lot of changing going in the next few years. And uh, those that get it will and those that don't won't. <laughs> and things move so fast now that they remember back in the early days, I remember my parents having, you know, and their friends had a family. You can make mistakes and not realize something, and you know, six, seven years later you're going, Boy, I better make an adjustment here. You know, and now it's like if you miss something a year later, you can go like, I'm done. I, I've been ran over, and I somehow or another I missed the train, and I didn't even see it come to the station. You know, so, I mean, the business moves so fast now; it's just amazing. But anyway, okay. that takes us to one o'clock, one o two actually. Don't okay. forget to fill out the uh, evaluation form. It's really helpful to us every day. And here's, here's the other thing: uh, Gary will. Be up here until 1:20. If somebody has specific questions, you want to ask. At 1:20, we're doing our founders pick group, where we do a little podcast thing that I will interview him, and it'll be available online. And you can go and see these little short snippets of what we've done in the past. So go to aslcpa.com, and you can see that. So at 1:20, I'm going to pull him out of this room. Right. So, Sounds like don't take too much of his time so everybody else can get it, but you might, you might want to write how they get contact me on there. Yeah, well, I'll go back to that. I put some business cards back there. If anybody grab a business card, feel free to shoot me a, a message. I'm easy, to, I'm easy to get it. All right, so let's give him a round of applause.